G'day guys, welcome to another year of uh, expat chat. We're now in 2020, the year is well under its way. My name's James Ridley, I'm the Managing Director for Alice Wealth Management of APAC Division and I'm joined today by Brett Evans, the uh, Managing Director for EMEA. How are you going Brett? Well thanks James. Yeah, well uh, in the, uh, the sand pit that's slowly getting warmer um, as we uh, leave winter unfortunately and head towards that hot summer period. That's right, and I suppose today, episode 12, very exciting to keep going, but before we jump into it, let's just make sure everyone's aware of that disclaimer. Yep, we love disclaimers in the financial services game, and uh, all information that you do either watch or hear from this, whether you, however you're consuming it, whether it's uh, via YouTube or the podcast, is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as personal advice. That's right, and obviously there's been a fair bit going on in the last, um, I suppose, few months. I mean, the main topic at the moment, as we know, COVID-19, coronavirus. God, yes. it's everywhere now, isn't it? It's just Look, it's it is. like wildfire. And like we were just discussing offline before, it, to me it's something mm -hmm. that, um, you know, even though we've been through these sort of things before, it is a new beast. Obviously the, uh, yeah. the attrition rate is a lot lower. Um, however, from our point of view, like we've said before, and we've been saying to clients in our uh, weekly communications that we've been keeping it up, up to speed on, it's yeah. not actually the, uh, uh, the death rates that are the concerns, it's the more ethereal fear um, that's changing people's habits, which in turn leads to obviously uh, financial ramifications. So when you look yeah. at companies that uh, uh, I say inclined or lean to tourism or travel, those mm -hmm. sort of things, obviously they'll feel the worst of it. But then there's yep. a lot of other companies that won't feel the worst of it, but you know, the baby is being thrown with the bathwater and we are seeing a lot of those sort of scenarios when it comes to uh, changes. So it's uh, mm -hmm. a matter of watch your space. You know, certainly, you know, I think we're looking at a lot of these scenarios and, and trying to map forward. The market always likes to map forward and yeah. uh, pricing these events. But, you know, we're in a bit of an unknown territory right now. Not that I think it's it's a bad scenario, yeah, financially. Yeah, yeah there will be yeah. a, a retraction in the GDP numbers, basically, because of people's spending habits changing. However, unless you're uh, Kleenex in Australia, when you're probably making a killing. Um, <laughs> yep. Yeah, we've all seen the memes and stuff going around with the, uh, the toilet paper buying in Australia, which is just <laughs> Or ridiculous. just talking about it before, off, uh, off air, I mean, I was in Coles just last night getting some groceries and I and even though everything's going on with the toilet paper, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna check the toilet paper aisle. I just have to see if it's you know, if it's see for yourself. local yep. on the Gold Coast. And I was shocked. The toilet paper aisle was just completely um, blank. There was nothing in there. Um, there's people still walking down there, see if they get some final rolls, but I just, uh, I'm just shocked. Why, why toilet paper? I mean, it, uh, I just, I don't know, I feel bad for Australians. Are we a bit silly in the way we approach this? <laughs> well, I mean, that's the thing. It's just, the, you know, one of the, the s symptoms of coronavirus is not diarrhea. So no, it doesn't again. cause, it doesn't cause gastro at all. There's, no. there's plenty of funny um, social media memes going around at the moment. I, I know. Um, you know, you've obviously seen some that I've had up there, which are quite funny, but it just, yeah, it does make sense. Obviously, it's gone rampant and, you know, it's, um, you know, obviously with it starting in Wuhan, we are starting to see it, it's coming across now to a lot of the developed countries, but obviously those developed countries have some good procedures and um, quarantining in place, but it just seems to spread very easy compared to previous items like, you know, your SARS, your MERS, those sort of things. Look, I think that's that's the, that's the key point, and I know, some countries are handling this better than others. Um, you know, I was telling you yesterday that uh, in Dubai, schools are closing down this week, yep. uh, or this weekend, I should say, uh, for four mm -hmm. weeks. And yep. um, we've yep. got obviously got the Easter slash spring break coming up, and uh, the idea will be they'll be doing online learning. And virtually what the school, what the, the government's going to do, the uh, Ministry of Education, is going to go through and actually disinfect every single school. Now, I can't remember the exact number of schools in Dubai, but I think it's something like 65. Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah they've certainly got their uh, their work cut out for them, but that they're trying to get on the front foot. Whereas, uh, like we discussed before, um, my main concern personally is Africa, which doesn't have the resources or the facilities in place to a, Handle. segregate and quarantine, and B, mm -hmm. um, have access to uh, you know, medication that helps them cope with the symptoms. So, 
Um, yeah, yeah there, there's always going to be these hot spots that pick up and down. You know, mm-hmm. we saw Saudi um, cancel a, a very predominant religious festival um, this week. So um, that's happening there, but Iran's still going ahead with theirs. So there, there is, you know, quite a, a waxing and a waning when it comes to, you know, different countries and their attitudes to the dealing with these sort of things. Uh, obviously, it's yep. great to see countries like the UAE just mm. getting on the front foot and just going straight into it and just knocking on its head. Yeah. But in yeah. saying that, um, I think watch your space and I think it's a conversation and a topic that we'll be talking about for, for many months to come. Yeah, that's right. I think, you know, as we've already seen in the markets, I mean, February, obviously, it's rounded out. But I think right now we're going to probably see the the, um, the share markets, you know, trade places probably each day, you know, up, down, up, down, up, down. Yeah. And it's probably going to stay like that for the next, you know, few months. I, you know, I think I'll predict four to six months before things get better. We're likely just to see it as it is. We're seeing most governments release some stimulus packages, most feds, you know, doing some rate cuts to sort of provide a bit of a cushion there and keep the liquidity in the markets, which is good to see. Uh, but I mean, you know, there's always a silver lining with these types of events. And, you know, right now, buying opportunities, you know, you know, it's been it's been a while since we've seen a lot of you know ETFs direct shares at these sort of prices. I mean, you look at the 2019 calendar year, great year for most markets, and now we've seen a bit of a pullback. Uh, you know, the pullback you know is alarming to a degree, but not anymore because we know what it's going to be starting to do over the next four to six months. If it stays like it is right now, and you're investing for the long term, it's a great opportunity to finally get in there. Especially with the dollar being where it is, and uh, yes, I think of course, you know, yeah. it, it's a it, yeah for those. Australian expats looking to play the long game. Um, a low dollar, yep. low equity markets. Um, there's value on both sides and they get a, a double bite of the cherry. So, you know, we've always gone on before, you know, about the benefits of investing back in Australia by way of uh, an investment portfolio picking up domestic and international equities uh, and fixed interest as opposed to property. Um, and, you know, to me, yes, there are some unknowns when it comes to what's occurring and, and with the coronavirus. But, you know, yeah. we know it's not going to be around forever, like with SARS and MERS and all those different, yep. and bird flu. Yeah, you know, it does yep. come and go. Um, yep. The economic fundamentals are still the same. Yes, there'll be softening in, in GDP figures and those sort of things. But if your view is the next two to five years, um, it could be an actually a, a brilliant opportunity. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, you know, you'd love to be the uh, big pharma company that, that cracks the chemical formula for, uh, <laughs> for uh, I suppose, you know, you know inoculating this uh, virus. I mean, what's funny, though, about mass media and the way they're reporting it, you know, none of them are reporting the recovery rate and people that are recovering. They're just reporting exactly. the negatives, which is feeding it, just feeding it and feeding it. And, you know, most of the clients that I've spoken to, they understand that. They go, yeah, the media's kind of pissing us off because we know, yes, it can be bad. We know people that are recovering from quite healthy individuals, people that unfortunately are passing away. The, they are the elderly and they are susceptible to, susceptible to respiratory or disorders such as pneumonia, coughing, those sort of things. And yeah. obviously when the, the, the bad fever kicks in, it's addressing it quickly, early intervention. Um, but again, yeah, unfortunately, most uh, media conglomerates are actually feeding this kind of hysteria. And that's, I suppose, drawing back to that toilet paper scenario in Australia. It is. I mean, we'll put the, uh, the link into the show notes, but there's a, it's a great chart uh, put out by the uh, John Hopkins University in America. Yeah, yep. And um, yeah, as of 9.13 a.m. here, which was 45 minutes ago, there's 95,416 cases, of which 53,278 recoveries and only yeah. 3,285 deaths. So I think we worked out 3.44% mortality rate. Um, yep. Certainly people's actions, you know, will be affected and, and their spending habits will be affected, but... In terms of a, uh, a, a global-wide recession, I can't see it happening. No. No, I think the governments are acting pretty quickly on this um, and, and providing enough liquidity and stimulus in most of, obviously, the developed countries. And I think at the moment it's just a waiting game. Yep, we're going to get through it. It's going to take a little while. Market's going to be choppy, but I don't think we're going to see you know any big pullbacks anymore. I think we've seen the worst of it, I think, at the moment. Again, it's just going to trade places, as you said, each week. You know, two steps forward, two steps back, two steps forward, two steps back as we round out the year. So um, it's just going to be, you know, for providing those opportunities or, sorry, rounding out the financial year here in Australia, see how it all goes. Completely agree. And I think, um, you know, it's something that uh, in a very interconnected world by way of social media and all the different platforms, um, 
investors and the markets in general can be very reactionary. And uh, as we know, fundamentals play a very big part in what happens with markets, but also psychology as well too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's sort of that um, that mob mentality, you know, and sort of even just word of mouth as well. Oh, I heard this, what I'm doing. And then it just begins to snowball. And that's what exactly. we saw throughout February. And now you can see that it's actually stopped. You know, that's why the market, you know, it's just closed up 1.1%. Yesterday it was down, I think, 0.7%. The day before that it was up 2%. So you can yeah. sort of already see a bit of a trend developing um, yeah. where, you know, that's probably going to be the trend that we'll see over the next few weeks, next few months. Yeah. I've had the major It'll, it'll see again. So. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. And I suppose one thing that I did want to reference outside of Corona was actually um, that Facebook group that we have uh, going, the Australian Expat Financial Forum and yes. some of the things that have been dropped in there as well. Um, yeah. I suppose, you know, in terms of another item that, you know, I want to talk about, and we both want to talk about today was regarding, you know, superannuation tips for expats. Yep. Um, so leading into that, um, you know, Brett, can you tell us a little bit more about that group that we have on there? Yeah, so we, as part of our, our narrative, I guess you could say, of educating Australian expats, we're always looking at new ways to uh, disseminate information and provide education regarding the issues surrounding Australian expats. And yep. uh, certainly Facebook groups are a massive part of the way people digest information. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we started the Australian Expat Financial Forum and, uh, you know, we've, we've had quite a rapid growth in numbers, which is great. So I think uh, yep. last count, I'm just uh, bringing it up on the screen now, you know, uh, almost 700, you know, 650 something. I can't remember exactly the numbers, but... You know, and it's great. It's it's a it's a way that people can digest the information in a native environment of on a platform that they're already on anyway. Um, yeah. So back in at the end of last year, we ran a ran a quick survey for uh, for group members. And uh, long story short, we asked them what are the key topics they would like us to discuss in 2020. So yeah. uh, we got uh, quite a few lists here. So number one on the list was superannuation tips. Number two, yes. tax effective investments. Number three, managing yep. Australian property. Number four, optimizing assets across countries. Number five, foreign pensions. Number six, managing tax residency and different financial years. And number seven, buying property for an eventual move back to Australia. So I yeah. think what we'll yep. do over uh, the course of our weekly episodes now that we're back online for 2020 is just mm -hmm. every episode, we're just gonna you know, cover off on each one of those topics. So today, yeah. It's going to be superannuation tips for Australian expats. Yeah, that's right, Brett. Now, before we dive into it, you know, I forgot to mention at the start of the episode about how I was both, well, both over there in Dubai. I came over and we held that um, that seminar. The expats, obviously, in Dubai yep, as top, well. Top twenty financial tips for twenty twenty. It was. That's right. Yeah, it was, a, and it was a great event. It was great to see so many Aussies coming together, and obviously, you know, mainly just an educational event. Things that you need to be aware of, um, depending, you know, based on that sort of you know, tax-free jurisdiction and the way things are taxed as well as a non-resident? Look, you know, the UAE still is the Wild West when it comes to, you know, financial services. And, yeah. uh, you know, we've got a long way to try to, you know, provide a compliant solution by being locally licensed, uh, not to sell insurance, but to actually provide financial services through the Dubai International Financial Centre. So, you know, from our point of view, um, it's now, I guess, our, our mantra to go forward and, you know, educate Australian expats. And there's a lot of key things we'll be rolling out in 2020 and, and future years, certainly not just for clients in the UAE, but also to people in, um, you know, other countries as well. Yeah, that's right. And I suppose coming back to superannuation tips for expats, so there's, there's quite a few and obviously it's going to depend on the super fund you're in. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a no-brainer, but, you know, when we become a, uh, a non-resident of Australia for tax purposes, and that's what we refer to, an Australian expat technically you know if we've got a um, superannuation fund that's in a, a normal retail master superannuation fund or maybe a superannuation fund which is in a, a, a wrap account or lastly a self-managed super fund you know the, the real sort of cautionary tale is if we have a self-managed super fund we're becoming a non-resident how is that going to be treated now that I suppose central management control is technically overseas unless we address it quickly before we, you know, we pass that sort of two year period of temporary absence. Should we go to just take a step back and just go to the 40,000 yep. foot view with super and yep. dispel a few myths. So super yeah, definitely. as a, as a, as a master platform is agnostic to tax residency. 
Yes, and I'll absolutely. put some caveats into that. But generally, super in itself, um, it doesn't matter whether you're an Australian resident or a foreign resident, you know, the tax rates, the applicable rules are still the same for everyone. Then we sift down into the types of super funds. So you've got obviously your industry funds, you've got your retail funds, and then you've got your self-managed super funds. So yeah. as you eloquently pointed out before, there is a whole basket and whole side to self-managed super funds that are, you know, a major concern for Australian expats based on central management mm -hmm. control and also to active members test. You know, people yeah. not realising you can't go overseas and uh, contribute to a self-managed super fund. A, you're probably breaching C and C, but B, you're also probably, you know, definitely, if you are contributing to it, you are breaching the, um, the active members test as well. But let's sort of run through how each of those different categories of super funds, you know, sort of relate to, to Australian expats. So kicking off the first one, we've got industry funds. Industry funds are certainly a beast to be reckoned with. You know, they're, they're a massive part yeah. of the superannuation landscape in Australia. Um, but what people need to be cognizant of is they are not designed, structured and uh, able to deliver something that is conducive for Australian expats. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is so many times we get people who call up Hester, Australian Super, you know, Host Plus, all those different sort of platforms. And they talk to a lady or a gentleman on the, uh, the call centre and, and they start asking, you know, questions. And very quickly, either the questions aren't framed right, so the call centre interprets them as being overseas on holidays or on a work trip and they'll provide information that is incorrect. Or yeah. a lot of the other times we, we find that people call them up and just don't get an answer that they're not framed yeah. or, or, you know, they're designed for the 99.9% .9 of their members, which are Australian resident. So yeah, the right. key considerations you have with industry funds, uh, certainly the first one is any insurance inside of super. Um, the industry funds are probably the most famous for charging expats uh, insurance premiums on policies that don't provide cover overseas. So no, uh, yeah. you may, you may be paying for something that, you know, you can't ac actually get access for, for those lawyers yep. on online and uh, in their ears. Um, I believe the legal term is a stopper when you're knowingly charging for a service that you know that you can't provide. So, uh, <laughs> and, and, and you, and you had that great scenario with, uh, with a client, or was it uh, 13,000 uh, dollars you got back from the fund? Uh, yeah. And it was, they, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the scenario with that one was, was quite unusual and, um, it was funny. I mean, on the super fund themselves, and I'm going through another process again, similar to this one, but um, the super fund knew they were living overseas, knew that they were living in another country. That was first recorded when they first left, so everything had been done correctly. And then, um, generally speaking, you know, that insurance was to remain valid for up to three years whilst they're living permanently overseas. So it was very lucky that they actually got that three-year benefit because that's really rare. Usually only applies to an Australian resident in the eyes of the AHO, which they aren't. So after that client had been overseas for about nine years, um, obviously there's a large period there, six years, where technically the insurance is invalid, but the onus doesn't fall on the superannuation fund to cancel the insurance or remove the premiums or anything like that. So they'll keep charging your premiums even though you're now paying for a product which you could never claim on. Um, which is ridiculous when uh, I suppose the premiums over that time frame can add up to you know thirteen, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars, which is a huge amount. So we went through the process of applying and, and seeing if we could get some sort of uh, refund back because you know it was a clear uh, statement that it's only valid for three years away, and it, it wasn't a quick process to be honest. It took almost twelve months going through that. It had to provide travel arrangements, had to provide previous tax returns, which reflected non-residency. But, you know, lucky for that client, they actually got that refund, which is great to see. So it just goes to show that, yes, you need to ask the right um, questions. Generally speaking, the people that you talk to when you're first having a chat to them on the phone, the administration officers, they're only to trained usually to uh, almost regurgitate what's in the product disclosure statement. Um, yeah. You know, they're not going to be able to give you specific advice or those sort of things. They'll try and pass you over to maybe a financial planning arm inside the super fund, which is normal. And when it comes to insurance, you know, you almost need to speak to three different, I suppose, levels, you know, getting to even the underwriters as well, as well as the claim assessors. 
and you know they'll usually send you definitions and those sort of things as part of the product disclosure statement as part of the underwriter as well and then you know that's when you actually find out whether it's valid or not so yeah it can be a bit of a lengthy process i probably could have shortened that story actually <laughs> no i think it's important people understand the the nuances and and you know i guess the amount of work that is required in the background to to get a positive result you know it's not just a matter yeah. of picking up the phone and saying hey you know yeah give us our money back um yeah there's yeah. a lot of lengths we go to for our clients when it comes to managing their super funds and uh you know it's always important that they understand the process um to manage ex expectations yeah yeah that's right and i suppose you know other things which i think somewhat not correct about how i suppose superannuation system in australia is technically how we're invested to a degree. I mean, I think we're all invested quite conservatively when we're in those my super options. Now, I'm not saying that this is advice to people that listen to this, but if we've never paid any attention to our super, how it's invested, and we have that investment for the length of our working career, technically it's probably uh, likely to be the longest investment that we're gonna hold throughout our life, but it's actually the one investment we give no attention to. We usually give attention to it in the last five years when we go, you know, shit, I'm gonna retire soon. I yep. need to. I need to start yeah. looking into this. Up, yeah, yeah. Which, yeah, which is usually too late, unfortunately. And it's a case when you can do things, but you've left it a little late, and that might mean you might have to, um, you know, work a little longer. Um, but it usually also means that if we're just in the standard my super option, but we're invested in in that option for the next twenty five years because we can't access the super, we might need to um, look at, you know, I suppose our asset allocations, the individual investments within the super fund and see if it's right for that applicable time frame, and that, you know, that kind of strategy, which usually it's not. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a great segue into the next, you know, class of super, which is retail funds. So, mm. yeah, I think people often don't identify with the category of the fund, but they identify with the brand. Yeah. So retail funds can be colonial first state. It can be AMP, um, Westpac with BT, you know, all those sort of funds. And, and while you tend to pay more for uh, a retail fund than you do with an industry fund, you tend to get more bells and whistles that go along with that. In saying yeah. that there are also just retail funds which don't provide any bells and whistles and just charge you quite a lot with little flexibility. And, and um, A&P is certainly one of those. You know, well, I did a review yep. recently and I was blown away by how much clients were paying to you know virtually get the option of ticking one of five boxes so yeah. that's certainly a key <laughs> consideration as well which yeah you know, as you correctly pointed out you know when you jump on that plan you fly overseas um you know super it becomes a distant memory it becomes a an email once every now and then from the fund an yep. email or a letter at the end of every financial year with your statement and people just yep. don't give it the time and, and the due care and attention so um, no. you know, the retail funds have been probably slaughtered the most in the Royal Commission due yep. to a incredibly poor uh, returns and incredibly yep. high fees. So yep. they're the ones we often say to clients, you know, they're the ones who, you know, to us are easy to review because, you know, there's uh, a great apathy by those providers on what clients are actually receiving. So. Yeah. Certainly, you know, that's the uh, the next category. And then the last category is obviously the self-managed super fund, which some yep. people not, are not sure whether they have a self-managed super fund or not. The best way to determine whether you do or not is are you the trustee of your own fund and do you have to do annual lodgements? Uh, yeah. If you do, then Ordinary. you have a self-managed yeah, self super fund. The, mm. the, for a self-managed super fund to be compliant, there's a number of tests. The first test is being established in Australia. The second test is having central management and control uh, in Australia. And uh, I'm jumping here and remind me that the third test is the active members test. And uh, there's one more there which will come to me in a second. But certainly from an Australian expat's point of view, the main ones are central management and control. Uh, and that's the overarching control of the fund, not uh, having a financial planner or a stockbroker or an accountant controlling what goes to account but the actual ability to hire and fire those people. And uh, a lot of people will, you know, they'll go through and appoint a brother or sister-in-law or parents to be their, their trustee of the, of the fund. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to just quickly cover off on that? Because that's a, that's a you know, a, a bit of a no-no when it comes to, you know, a lot of key issues. 
Yeah, well, I mean, when we're appointing a friend or a family member and, and giving them that EPOA or the enduring power of attorney to make those decisions on our behalf, you know, at the end of the day, if the ATO picks that up and looks at the fund and sees that 50% or more of the beneficial interests are still held by an individual that's a non-resident, it's a bit of a, a key concern from the ATO's point of view because they can say, okay, well, why is your brother-in-law making all the decisions on something which is actually is your asset? You know, we can always go to the level of extent in removing ourselves. You know, if it's you know within an SMSF, there's different structures. We can be individual trustees, or we can be have a company inside there, a corporate trustee, which we're directors of. So, it's quite common that you'll see new expats or that have header overseas. They'll remove themselves as directors. They'll give their brother-in-law or their sister or their father, parents, um, make them a sole director, and they'll also give them an enduring power of attorney to make decisions on the self-managed super fund. But you know, the simple tests that the ATO look at, okay, well, where are 50% or more of the beneficial interests held? If they're still held towards a non-resident, then the ATO can still lean on the fact that, okay, perhaps central management control is actually still being held outside of that. And then that's when they'll have to look at some other things, like have we breached the active members test, such as has there been rollovers um, received by other super funds? Have there been any contributions made into that SMSF on behalf of those members that are living permanently overseas? Insurance premium, it, it, it can be almost um, the, the smallest little thing which can impact um, active members test, which can cause it to be, or deemed to be non-complying. When it's deemed to be non-complying, it means the super fund loses its concessional treatment. Now, just a, as a reminder of the concessional treatment that SMSFs and super gets, has a maximum tax rate of 15% on income, dividends, distributions, and if we hold an investment within super for a period greater than 12 months, our capital gains tax rate is only 10%. If it's deemed to be non-complying, they do penalise you. They, they levy the highest um, Australian tax rate on that, 47% on the income, as well as the assets, the balance, as punishment for running a non-complying SMSF. Um, there was a case not too long ago where they found this SMSF to be non-complying, however, they gave the individuals 12 months to wrap it up. They're living overseas in the UK. One of the individuals was actually diagnosed with a terminal illness and actually was given a, about 18 months to live. So the ATO still made them wind it up within 12 months, but they didn't penalise them. Um, that was a very rare case that we've seen, but it just is a bit of a cautionary tale and a lesson to be learned that the ATO does not muck around when it comes to obviously looking at these types of concessionally taxed vehicles uh, and obviously you know applying those tests you know technically there are ways you can do it but you are really really running a bit of a fine line with the ATO then in the event you're gone for 5, 10, 20, 50 years um, you know you can still contribute to super but if you want an SMSF steer clear of it you know you've got your options around your retail super funds um, industry super funds those sort of things you know they're agnostic tax vehicles they're very different to an SMSF we will know if we've got an SMSF because the as Brett put it before, we know that we're lodging tax returns or doing audits um, each year and it's a bit of a burden doing them um, if we have one. So, you know, we'll, it's pretty obvious if we're running an SMSF. And also too, I think the other issue as well is, you know, when you're running an SMSF, um, you know, there's, there's reasons why you'd maintain an SMSF if you moved overseas. Um, certainly if you're holding stuff that's, not easily be sold down or transferred. So like physical property, gold bullion, yep. artwork, rare cars. Um, yeah. which quite a few. <laughs> yep. So yep. in that case, um, rather than appointing a brother or a system or a parents as trustee, probably the mm. most uh, compliant solution is to convert your SMSF into what's called a small APRA fund. Yep. And uh, essentially, you know, that then removes the issue of the trustee you appoint yeah. a trustee, a corporate trustee in Australia to manage your super fund and mm -hmm. uh, it you know, maintains its compliance. Uh, yeah. and, and you know, if you're talking about a reasonable balance, you want to make sure your solution is quite robust. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, you, you mentioned small APRA fund um, and you know, converting it. It's not an easy process either. And you're obviously paying that new trustee you know, to manage it. You're paying them a fee. And to be honest, there's actually not too many services in Australia which go down that path and look, look after it. So, you know, I, I can't even rattle off three, to be honest. I think I've come across, um, uh, oh, actually, I can't even rattle off, rattle off run right now. I think there's, yeah. I want to say AIG, is it? 
Australian exec- yeah. a- a- AET, Australian Executive. Yeah, that's it. Australian and Executive then I think that, Yeah, Perpetual. and I think maybe Perpe- Perpetual or IWF have an arm as well. Yep. And then maybe Sargon, but I'm not sure what's going on with Sargon at the moment, as we know. So yes. um, uh, I suppose there's not too many at all. Um, and, I mean, you know, back in the day, SMSS were all the range, rage because people thought they could manage their super a lot better than the, the super funds that were on offer. And, you know, yeah, you know, they give you the advantage of being able to buy physical property, commercial property, those sort of things. But these days, if you're just setting up an SMSF to access and invest in direct shares, you don't need to. You know, don't you can to. set up... You can you can go to a retail um, wrap super fund, which do exist, and you can invest in direct shares or international shares and manage funds and those sort of things. You know, you just don't need to go through that lengthy process anymore, which is great. It makes it a lot easier. Yep. No, no, I totally agree. And that's the, uh, you know, certainly when I started providing uh, advice on self ownership of fund portfolios um, <laughs> quite a while ago, you know, early sort of yep. early 2000s when they first started to really become predominant. Um, yeah. There was no other alternative but to run an SMSF to have actually have control and uh, flexibility. These days, mm-hmm. as long as you're not holding physical assets, you know, like a car or a house or artwork or gold bullion, you actually have no requirement to have an SMSF. You can do everything yep. else through, you know, a um, you know, a retail platform. And and this is probably a good segue into sort of giving people an idea of of what we do for expats. Because yes, as okay. well as providing advice on, you know, super funds to expats, we also manage a lot of super funds for expats. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. you know, probably I think last count was something like sixty-five percent of our assets under management, uh, super funds. And yeah. I guess the the people who approach us are the ones who are disenfranchised or disheartened with who's managing it for them right now. Uh, they may be getting poor performance, high fees, and or both. And as well yeah. as you know, the AMPs, the colonial first states, the Australian supers of the world aren't actually reaching out to them on a, on a regular basis saying, hey, how's things going? This is what's going on with your account. So We know why, though. <laughs> yes. Yeah, of course we do. Yeah, well, we covered that up. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think we've covered it off on a previous episode, actually, but a lot of those firms obviously have issues talking to someone that's overseas. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, to us... Uh, being overseas is no excuse for not a being able to control your super fund and mm-hmm. b uh, actually uh, you know it's it's not a nice way of putting it but giving a shit about mm. your money you know yeah, it, yeah. It, it's yeah. you know even with people who they say oh, I've only got a low balance you know it doesn't mean anything to me if you yeah. walk down the street and you saw you saw twenty fifty seventy thousand dollars sitting on the ground would you pick it up of course you would <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly you know, super is exactly the same. You know, yep. the little things done now give you the greatest benefit down the track. And, yep. you know, I think it's almost a, an Australian pastime to whinge about poor performance of super. And I don't have any time for people who whinge about it unless they actually take action to do something about it. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. you know, our, our clients, are, you know, we've got north of 30 countries now. You know, mm. everyone's got super that they're managing. And, yep. uh, you know, now that we put the framework in place, you can have a super fund back in Australia. You can have all the functionality that you'll ever need, plus then some. And mm. there's accountability. Whereas yeah. up until now, there's no, there's been, there's been no accountability by the industry uh, mm. for poor performance and high fees and those sort of things. Whereas I guess what we provide our clients is, you know, if you'd like to engage us to manage your super fund. We will tell you the exact fees. We will tell you your own specific performance and we'll be accountable to you for what happens on that account and how it works with your jurisdiction. You know, certainly we've covered off quite a fair bit uh, on our blog posts, but not, not so much on the, on the podcast. Um, mm. You know, the complexities of managing super as a US-based expat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, absolutely. So, um, joining the dots. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean... I was going to go into one of the tips that we mentioned when we had that seminar and it's about contributing to obviously super, the types of contributions, you know, back in Australia, we're lucky enough to have that super guarantee contribution that we get from our employers, you know, the, the set rate, nine and a half percent. When that nine and a half percent goes in, you know, it has a contributions tax, which comes out of it, 15%. Obviously, if we're an expat, we're living a 
away and we're working in a jurisdiction that doesn't do retirement benefits. You know, obviously the Middle East sort of end of service gratuities, but those end of service gratuities aren't really on par with those kind of contributions that you would have had going into your super fund. The US, the 401ks, only if you opt into it. Um, UK, same with the UK pensions. I think it's only five, six percent, so not too much there. So, you know, when we're away, we still should look to contribute to that retirement asset, especially if we're going to come back and you know retire back in Australia, accumulate that wealth in Australian dollars, you know, reduce that long-term currency risk as well. But you know, you can put yourself at an advantage by contributing to that super. But if you've got no sort of other income in Australia, so you're not part of a tax planning sort of strategy, you could put in an after-tax contribution, increases the tax-free component. It has no 15% contributions tax which comes out of that and you're actually ahead of say I don't know your, your colleague back in Australia who's a normal Australian tax resident because you're not having any contributions tax come out of that contribution your super is actually going to go at a rap, you know, a more I suppose rapid rate compared to theirs because you're increasing the tax-free component and if you're putting away you know I'd say eight to twelve percent of your your base salary um, now into super, I mean, yeah, you know, you're going to be pretty happy, especially the fact that you've increased that tax-free component, no contributions tax has come out of that, and, you know, you'll feel good about yourself in 10, 15, 20 years when, you you know, you're sort of looking at your assets and going, okay, I've got a good super fund now, I'm, I'm happy when I'm retiring because I've got that income stream compared to, hang on, I've got my assets still over in another country, you know, do I look at withdrawing that, how's that going to be treated? You're sort of planning for that long-term return. Well, let me, let me throw this at you. Yeah, this time last year, the dollar was about 75 cents uh, to the US yeah. dollar. So yeah. quick numbers right now, the Australian dollar is down 13.3%. If you were just doing a consistent contribution into your super at as a non-concessional, so coming in tax-free, yes, you are essentially getting an extra 13% lift in the amount you're contributing to your super fund in Australian dollars, if you, as what you were doing last year for the same amount of US dollars or whatever that currency might be. So, yeah, you know, certainly we always talk about the best place to accumulate wealth is the place that you tend to return to or retire to. It doesn't make sense. If you have no intention to return back to Australia, it doesn't make sense to keep repatriating money back to Australia. And that would be That's probably right. be 20% of expats. The other 80% mm -hmm. have some intention to return back to Australia, whether it's one, three, five, 10 or 15 years. So yep. why not take advantage of certainly, you know, the dollar being where it is. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're transferring, you know, the same amount every month and the dollar's falling, you're getting more purchasing power, which is actually going to pick up in retirement because essentially you're contributing more to super than you were before with the same mm -hmm. amount of US dollars or whatever equivalent, whether it's Hong Kong dollars, dirhams, you know, and so on and so forth. Yeah, well, it's easy to talk about US dollars and peg it to that, to be honest. But I mean... You make an interesting point about the exchange rate and how it's changed. And personally, I think we probably we probably haven't seen the bottom of the AUD. I think it might have a little bit more to depreciate probably in the coming months if we see another rate cut. Yeah. But you know that means that you know once we hit that floor, uh, if we see it down to 63, which you know, who knows, um, yep. you know, it gets down there, you know, amazing opportunity for people that are still sending you know repatriating money back to Australia, putting it into their different sort of strategies, their pots or their buckets, whatever it might be. Um, but then, you know, we start to see it appreciate. So you've missed an opportunity there. If you've sort of been sitting on the sideline. Um, I suppose, you know, right now, you know, we're lucky enough to have clients approach us with that, you know, saying, is it a good time to buy? For, you know, obviously there is buying opportunities right now, silver lining, coronavirus, those sort of things. Um, so, you know, if they're holding that investment for the next five years and, you know, the dollar starts to appreciate, then, you know, they've made it, they've, they've capitalised on a great opportunity. Yep. And look, that's a, you know, it's, if, if I look at the clients of Atlas who have done well, they're not the highest earners. They're just those who have had the right mindset and take advantage of opportunities. Simple yeah. as that. You know, yep. you know, we've got clients from five digits to seven digits in terms of annual earning capacity. And it's not the seven digit clients, the ones that are, are killing it. It's that mm. sort of middle of the road sort of client who just, consistently put something in place that uh, almost by magic it just works and it's yeah. being consistent in, in your you know starting off I guess from the start reviewing everything making sure what you're doing is right and then once you you know you put something in place that is you know a 
giving you performance, B, doesn't cost you the fort, you know, the world, but C, takes into account your expat, you know, sort of uh, uh, lifestyle. And then just doing something consistently and then taking advantage of low dollar and all these sort of things. And guess what? Yeah. You, you'll you find in five or 10 years, just this money just magically there because the power yeah. of compounding, you know, 7% return every year for 10 years, you double your money. You That's imagine right. 7% return a year plus ongoing contributions, you're getting compounding on compounding and mm. suddenly, you know, what your balance will be after two, five and 10 years it's going to be exponential. It's going to really ramp up because you're making money yeah. upon money upon money. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose one thing that you, you mentioned before, taking it away from the contributions, the exchange rate was, you know, you know, obviously we've got the industry super funds, which we discussed. We've got the retail super funds, um, which is a bit of a combination of your wrap accounts or your master trust. Master trust um, is usually a case where, We've got those five standard investment options, you know, the my super balance option, the high growth, the growth, those sort of things. Sometimes they might have some off um, off the side investment options like direct shares, you know, Australian shares, international shares, but it's all through this master trust. So when we get our statement, usually when we look at those that, um, you know, we're in these master trusts, common one, Sun Super, Australian Super, those guys, you know, we look at our statement and it just says, okay, income, growth of the units that we hold, um, you know, administration fees and you know our net balance it doesn't tell us too much more and that's really common with a master trust you know everything contained within the units of those different investment options when you compare that to a wrap platform or a wrap account um, you know that's usually on wraps we can access direct shares managed funds ETFs <laughs> however there's a lot more transparency you know we can see dividends actually flowing into our account from those individual holdings we can at the end of the financial year around September October November depending on the super fund if we've been investing in you, you know your normal ASX blue chips um, that pay fully frank dividends, we'll actually see tax credits flow into our account because of the frank and credit refunds. Yep. Um, it's almost like you have a self-managed fund, but you don't. You've just got a simple platform that's in, invested in your direct shares. There's a lot more transparency and options around those types of accounts. Um, and you know, depending on our balance, what our investment strategy is, it's going to depend whether we should be master trust or more of a wrap type account. But one of the other key takeaways is that these retail super funds that are wrap platforms is when we come up to a retirement I and mean, we're going from accumulation phase to a pension phase, if we're in a typical master trust, they usually have to sell us out of that investment option, the my super balanced life cycle option. There's going to be some capital gains tax applicable to that transaction because obviously we've, we've been in that investment option for the last 20, 30 years. Long term holding that investment, so 10% capital gains tax, they move the, pro the proceeds into our pension um, account and then they reinvest us. And we always notice a discrepancy between the two, unfortunately. Um, that's quite common. Um, and it just means that they've, you know, they've been out of taxes on that final amount as we've transitioned to, into a tax-free environment now. With wrap accounts, platform accounts, when we're holding direct shares, those sort of things, if it's built into the trustee of that particular super fund, they don't actually have to sell down your investments at all. You know, they can do what's called an in-specie transfer where they're transferring your assets directly into pension phase, because you're not realising any capital gains, there's no final tax. It's built in only to some within the trustee. I'm not going to say it's a it's sort of, you know, a fishing net cover all, um, a blanket no. effect there. Um, but it just means that we do technically, there are ways that you can actually accumulate wealth within super in a capital gains tax-free environment, depending on the super fund. And if we're not realising capital gains and switching around the investment options within that. Um, but it's just a, an important takeaway that there are ways that I suppose expats can accumulate wealth outside of super and then transfer that wealth into super by in species transfer again, making use of after tax contributions. And then again, pension phase, you know, it, it's, it's a funny scenario, but there are ways that over the long time you can actually, or a lifetime, you can still accumulate wealth tax-free as a non-resident. And there's two, actually two points there, you know, that I'll, I'll sort of go into more detail as well too. If you're yep. in those my super type, you know, sort of uh, master trust uh, investments. Yes. A, they're what's called pooled investments, which means everyone in that investment shares both the gains and the liabilities. And the liabilities is a big one because let's say, for example, the fund manager bought BHP for $10 a share back in 2000 and they decide to sell some uh, because they're re-weighting out of resources, then... Yep. You know, you might have only been that for a month or, or a year, but if they do yep. sell that and crystallise capital gains, 
you actually wear that liability all the way back to 2000. And I've it's seen ridiculous. this case, you know, some, you know, scenario before with people getting large tax bills in their super fund. Again, what's going on here? In actual fact, you know, because they've taken a pooled investment opportunity, you know, they're wearing a big liability. The second one is when you were talking about with the master trust selling down the assets to move the cash over to the pension account, there's often about a three to 4% spread between the price and the units they're buying and selling. So yep. when, when they sell you down, you're getting the selling price. And the best way to describe that is it's like the foreign exchange rates. There's the official rate, but then there's the rate that you get through your bank or your FX provider. Same thing yep. with, with managed funds. And yep. what they'll do is they'll clip two to 4% of your balance after paying for the tax on the way down, move the cash across, and then they rebuild it. They'll charge another two to 4% to rebuild it. So, yep. you know, you combine that two to 4% either side and then add it to the capital gains tax. Um, yeah. There can be quite a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose, you know, it's one of the reasons we've probably had that Royal Commission where the super funds were on the stand. And I mean, I think A&P come out of that pretty, pretty badly. As we know, I think the share price says it all. Tells yeah. a good story. Um, and I suppose one, one super fund that just popped into mind that we haven't really actually touched on is public sector funds. And these funds, which are untaxed yep. for the life of having them, and it's it's a funny scenario the way that they remain untaxed because technically, a government super fund, if it's untaxed, which and I'll be honest, uh, ladies and gentlemen, they are very rare these days. I think South Australia has some, WA maybe, um, and Tasmania. Yeah. Um, so funny, your Tasmania. Um, funny story. Someone asked if you needed a passport to go there the other day, and just I couldn't believe it. Wow. Anyway. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, digress. Um, untaxed super funds. Um, so what's funny about these super funds is we receive contributions, but from our employer, but there's no contributions tax which actually comes out of them because they're an untaxed super fund. The only things that we see coming out of them are actually the fees that the super funds charge us on. What's quite funny about that is because our balances will be a bit higher than the average super fund because no tax has come out of it and the fees that are charged on that account by the government super fund is actually usually a percentage base. It means the government super fund is actually earning more revenue from these type of super funds over the life of holding them because everything's untaxed. So your yep. super fund balance is technically higher for a longer period. And then when we roll the super fund out to another normal retail industry super fund, whatever you might do, or, or even an SMSF if you're a normal Australian tax resident, that's when you have to pay the tax over the life of holding it. So we notice a huge amount just gets zapped from that rollover Straight and it out. could be up to you know 10 to 15% of that balance gone because you've never paid tax on it. People panic, but it's just because these super funds do still exist. They're, they're probably not going to exist in five or 10 more years, but they're untaxed. But what's funny about them is it actually allows that super fund to earn more revenue off those clients. It's ridiculous. Yeah. That's, yeah, why they members, the, say. that's why they created the future fund because essentially there's this unfunded liability of all this tax that uh, they haven't been putting aside. And the government yeah. realised that uh, in the 2000s, they thought, wait a minute, we've got all these public sector funds. And uh, you know, to me, that's you know, obviously an issue. You've also got issues as well too with some of the ones like Uni Super went through a bit of dramas a number of years ago with unfunded um, liabilities as well too. So yep. look, it really comes down to you know uh, understanding what you're invested in and understanding yep. how that works. The the liabilities that you just mentioned then, I can only assume that's probably referred referring to defined benefits or defined benefit schemes when people are retiring. Correct. Is that what you mean? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, where you know, you know, they've had employees that have worked for them for the last, you know, 15, 20 years. And then these employees are coming up to retirement, you know, classic case of, you know, baby boomers falling through retirement right now. A lot of them will have these defined benefit schemes and they're about to draw either an income stream from it or they're given, a, I suppose, a, an end of, you know, payout value that they can transfer to another super fund and do what they want with and not be able to fund these schemes. So that, that makes sense, you know. Defined benefits, though, they're not very common these days, are they? Look, UK has got a massive problem. You know, there's a lot of um, defined benefit schemes which are private in the UK, as opposed to being provided by, the, say, the, a government service. And yep. uh, I think last time I saw the number, it was something like there's 500 billion pounds in unfunded defined benefit schemes in the UK. 
God. That's, so uh, that's yeah, concerning. Yeah. Jesus. And, and and if you if you go to your UK pension provider, you can actually ask for a payout ratio. Yes. And they'll say they'll pay you between eight and I've seen as high as sixty five times um, of your nominated uh, monthly payout. I guess you could say, yep. you know, what they'll pay you out in retirement. So because yep. they want to get rid of this liability. So yeah. um, it's something that, you know, for those in the UK to consider and, and uh, seek advice on because, um, yeah, that could become a problem down the track. Yeah, and I suppose one thing I didn't actually uh, flesh out a little bit, to find benefit schemes, the way they usually operate is that they, they say that, you know, we have a certain balance and it's based off our current um, sort of average income. And depending on our, you know, work rate within the government, we get a productivity level. That productivity level, depending on how long we've worked for the government, um, gets times by a multiple, and that sort of gives us our end balance, or they deem it to be an income stream worth this much. Obviously, the longer we're working for that government under that super fund, the higher the income stream is going to be um, per month, or um, the higher the end payout value will be. But we don't really have any control over how it's invested at all. Um, we're just sort of given that multiple of productivity that gets put onto it. And, you know, longer the years, obviously, the larger the multiple increases. And they actually, they're not bad funds, to be honest, depending on the government and, and the multiple you get. But, um, you know, it's very rare that you see them sort of, uh, or any new ones being created anymore. They're usually quite, cl they're closed schemes these days. Yeah, uh, but there's no new ones, no, no new people coming in. You know, everything's going back down to the, um, yeah, the fully funded options. Defined contribution plans. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're spot on. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, you can understand why it's unfunded liability. The government's sort of gone, sh you know, shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I've got all these babies. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's the elephant in the room. And, uh, you know, the, the, the future fund, which a lot of people think it's there to fund, you know, Australian growth. It's not. It's just there to pay for uh, government employee uh, liabilities going forward. Yeah. So yep, if you look at the absolutely. size of that fund, it'll give you an idea of how big that liability is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wonder if they'll dip into it at any stage for other things. We just <laughs> exactly. Oh, who just... knows? Who knows? They always yeah. get the goalposts. So, but uh, yeah, look, I, I think we've we've pretty much yeah we could talk on super for hours. Um, I, I think we've sort of covered off on some of the main points. What I'll do is, if you do want to learn more about super, jump onto our website atlaswealth.com. If you go into the resources section, we do have a, an expat super guide that you can download and read more about. Um, yep. So definitely, definitely do that. Um, you know, certainly what most people do is just drop us a, uh, an inquiry via the website, atlaswealth.com, mm -hmm. um, and uh, hit contact us and, and we can certainly organise a time to run through your particulars. Um, you know, if you want to email us directly, info at atlaswealth.com. There yep. are a lot of other issues. We certainly haven't covered off on how super funds work with the US. Uh, that is a daily evolving beast that we're yes. pretty in tune with in what's going on. So keep yep. an eye out. We've got some uh, quite um, pertinent uh, blog articles that we're we'll releasing over the next week um, with some changes yes. there as well. So uh, yes. keep an eye out there because, um, yeah, that is something that, uh, you know, we do have a lot of clients in the US. I think last count I looked at, I think something like 25, 30% of our client base is now US. Um, so yeah. it is a big part. We know how to navigate that space. We understand it. Uh, but even that doesn't mean if you're a client in the UAE, UK, Europe, wherever it may be, Antarctica, um, it doesn't mean <laughs> that we can't help you as well because we manage super funds for, for clients in all those other re regions as well too. Yeah. So, yeah. and yeah. one last request as well is we're loving the feedback on the podcast. Uh, it will be in the world to us if you could just quickly give us 30 seconds of your time to give us a review. The more reviews we get, the more expats we're able to reach. Obviously, uh, you know, the podcasts work on an algorithm and when they see that, you know, people are liking it, they'll recommend it more to others. And uh, it's something we really, really want to, you know, sort of just have this global conversation of education about managing your finances as expats. Certainly the next episode we'll run through, uh, the next topic on that list was um, tax effective investments as an expat. So that'll be the, yeah, uh, I, the next episode. <laughs> That's going to be an interesting topic. I, I bet there's a, a few people that are in the Middle East that are loving ticking that one, uh, as we know why. But yeah, I mean, Ladies and gentlemen, if you've got things that you want us to talk about in this podcast as well, you know, send it through either on that Facebook group, the Australian...
expat financial forum we, you know we'll bring it up we'll talk about it if you're not on the group you know feel free to add yourself that's fine um, or comment you know especially on the podcast themselves if, if you want us to address some things you know we do this for you it's all about education learning more about this realm um, because as Brett always puts it the goalposts are always moving whether an expat or residing in Australia as a normal Australian tax resident so episode 12 wrapping it up now on to episode 13 soon to be released uh, over the next week or two Fantastic. Well, thanks, James, and uh, we'll see you next week on episode 13 of Expat Chat. Sounds great, Brett. Thanks for your time. Speak soon. Take care, mate. See you, mate.